Hello and welcome to this edition of People's History Hour here on 104.5 WRFU Radio for Urbana. WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana-Champaign community, and the views we express here tonight are those of we, the speakers, and are not intended to represent WRFU, the IMC, or the Urbana Socialist Forum. I'm Grant Neal. And I'm Nick Cadell. Excellent to have you with us this evening, as always. Before we get started, I just want to remind you to check out our Facebook page. That's the People's History Hour with Grant Neal and Nick Cadell. On our Facebook page, you can find links to all of our old shows, uh, links to our future shows, and comments about what we have scheduled for the rest of the summer. Uh, you can also find information about how to contact us. We would welcome any ideas, feedback, critiques of what we do. If you think uh, there's something you'd like to see different on the People's History Hour, if you want us to use a different mode of analysis, or if you have an idea for a show even, please hit us up. We'd love to hear it. I uh, also encourage you to check out the rest of the fantastic shows on WRFU. You can find those on WRFU.net. You can also listen to all of the WRFU shows, such as the World Labor Hour, uh, the uh, Wannabe Cafe with George Hardebeck, the excellent After Work Drive show with DJ BJ Clark. You can listen to all these great shows on the WRFU website on the live stream. Uh, you can also listen to us on the uh, app TuneIn. It's a great app that lets you access thousands of free radio shows across the United States. You can listen to us there. Uh, and now you can listen to the People's History Hour on YouTube. We just got our YouTube channel up. We're slowly adding more shows. It takes a bit of time to add them, but be on the lookout if you prefer YouTube to listen to us adding more shows there every day. Take a look at the People's History Hour channel and subscribe if you so wish. Reinhold Pobel was born in 1915 in Hamburg, Germany. His father, father was at the front during World War I for his birth. At the end of the war, Pobble's family started a small coffee retail business, only for the hyperinflation of the early 1920s Germany to later destroy their savings and business. In a time of utter despair across Germany, Pobble grew up in religious life, becoming a big member of his Catholic students' organization at school, hoping to study theology as an adult, possibly even becoming a priest. That was in 1936. By 1939, Pobble was in the works of writing his first book when he got a blue envelope mailed to him. It was his draft notice. Pavel was made to join the Wehrmacht and take part in both the Eastern Front campaigns as well as the war in Italy when it came. At the end of 1943, Pavel was captured by American troops in Italy. He was transferred to the United States and became a POW here in Illinois, with Nick and I's hometown of Washington, where he we went to school, being the place he escaped from. He escaped in September 1945 and lived for nearly eight years under an assumed identity in Chicago before his capture by the FBI, and this is his story. In the 1980s, a sociologist at the University of Southern California, Malcolm Klein, was conducting tests and research on young gang members. A psychologist by training, but a sociologist and criminologist and a jack of all social sciences in practice, Klein was not a lot like his predecessors in criminology. Many of those that came before Klein in the study of crime and gangs and youth delinquency presupposed that crime was directly related to economics, that criminals developed when they had few structural opportunities to better their lives in, besides crime. Klein was suspicious of this idea, as well as another older idea that crime revolved around the sticks and carrots present in a society. This idea, the product of rationalist, classical liberals, and utilitarians like Jeremy Bentham, held that crime rates would fall should we have the proper heavy costs and societal responses in place for them. The death penalty, lengthy prison sentences, or hefty fines, the sticks, for even the smallest of offenses, it was thought, should all be used to prevent crime from happening. Instead of these ideas, though, Klein was on the tail end of a new wave of criminologists working in the 1960s through the 1980s. Rather than uh, emphasizing the carrots and sticks or simple economics as the causes and preventions of crime in our society, some of these new criminologists placed emphasis instead on the structural opportunities for crime afforded by society. In particular, emphasis was placed on three factors. The first was the likelihood of someone to be a criminal or an offender of the law. This likelihood is, of course, formed by you know, the broad societal determinants and structures as previously thought. It wasn't really new for these criminologists to be suggesting that one factor of crime was how likely someone was to be a criminal, based on their experience in society and their resultant conclusions about what they must do to survive. What was different about this approach was that these criminologists, uh, chief among them Marcus Felsen and Lawrence Cohen, thought that the likelihood of someone to be more willing to break the law was just one factor among these other two. The second factor was whether likely criminals had suitable targets for their crimes. The third factor was interrelated with the second. This was whether there was guardianship over suitable targets. 
crime was thought of as the convergence of these three points in time and space, as whether there was likely offenders that were given structural opportunities by way of unguarded targets. For example, several studies began to show in the 1990s that people were more likely to be the victims of robbery if they lived alone, with the explanation being that there, were, there was more time where their homes were left unguarded, thereby more time for likely criminals to uh, seize upon these unguarded opportunities. Klein was part of a generation of scholars in the 70s and 80s that welcomed these early new trends which would become more widely accepted by the 90s and 2000s as, as structural crime or routine crime theory, routine activity theory. But Klein wanted to take criminology in a different way. While the theories of Cohen and Felsen and other routine activity theorists regarding structural opportunities for crime were certainly more satisfactory than old theories, they could, for instance, explain how crime rose even while the U.S. and most Western economies were booming in the 1950s and 1960s, and when poverty was down slightly due to intensive welfare programs, while theories of routine activity and structural opportunity could explain crime this way, they left out a lot of the personal psychology of the first factor, the criminals. The question of what made one li more likely to be a criminal was left still more ambiguous, at least early on. In the late 1950s, Malcolm Klein was a graduate student of psychology busy teaching and writing. He was about to take a public health job at Berkeley when a friend recommended him to try out a job working with gangs in the L.A. area. Klein was suspicious at first. He had never taken any courses in li his life in criminology, and had only really had one course in sociology, and he knew basically nothing about the urban gangs of the California streets. Yet he went with a gang worker that night to attend a local gang meeting. Klein was enraptured by what he saw there that night, a fight between gang members over whether or not they should hire a new person to do a job for them. The fight related to a factionalized struggle that was ongoing in the gang. Klein saw before him basically everything that he had until then only read about in the abstract. Communication, group identities, psychologies of anger and frustration, leadership questions, and more. That night, he decided to take the job studying and working with gangs. The ultimate goal was to find out how they worked and use this knowledge to reduce criminal delinquency amongst the youth of California. Part of these studies involved understanding how gang cohesiveness worked. Klein and his cohorts found that the more the gang consider themselves to be a gang, a group of individuals working together with a shared group identity, the more that the gang had meetings, social activities, correspondence, and regularized actions organized as a group, the more that the gang activity increased. This idea probably doesn't sound that interesting to you at first. Uh, it should seem obvious that the more that people identified as gang members and organized as members of a specific gang, the more they would be willing to organize illegal activities together as well. Klein and his researchers understood this principle, however, by mistake. At first, when they were going to gang meetings, they hoped that the more that they rationalized everything, the plainer it would be to the gang members that they were becoming an illicit organization of criminal and immoral activity. So Klein and his researchers would uh, not go to gang meetings per se, but they would organize meetings of the youth of the California streets, and a lot of the teens that would show up would happen to be in gangs, and that was how they were gang workers, as they called themselves. But in fact, the opposite occurred when they tried to rationalize the organization and point out to the gang members, you know, you could organize this better if they happen to be talking about their gang activities at these teen youth meetings. The more that they rationalized gang activities and were hoping to make it plain that these were gang activities to these young people, the more that group cohesiveness increased and the more that uh, members of these gangs started to act more as gangs and perform more criminal activities. So after this was discovered, Klein and his team figured out that halting all of the activities that featured the gang as a group would reduce cohesiveness and gang activity overall. Uh, they were right to think this way. By their specific measurements, cohes cohesiveness of gangs dropped on average by about 50%, and gang activity declined once they started to de-emphasize uh, rationalizing the, their young study groups and started to de-emphasize people hanging out. So they started to de-socialize the groups and say, no, we shouldn't have a streamlined communication system just to show up. They started to say, no, we shouldn't uh, meet later as a group to watch this movie. Uh, just everybody leave. So as they started to de-emphasize the social elements and de-structure them, gang cohesiveness decreased as a result of these teen study groups being so uh, de-rationalized, you might say. Klein and his team emphasized that gang activity then was in part dependent on how much gang members identified as just that, gang members. But what makes identity? 
Klein and his team initially focused on internal factors, how the gang's activities together as a gang reinforced that group identity. However, Klein would later bring in the other part of identity, the external, how society's labeling of a gang uh, and gang members as such could reinforce that own identity and reproduce it. He would argue in his 1971 book, Street Gangs and Street Workers, that part of what mattered to gang activity was how society viewed criminal acts to be the work of gangs and labeled certain individuals as gang members. It was these labels, Klein thought, that contributed to one's identity as a gang member, as a criminal, and made one more likely to act out in criminal ways against the law in the first. In other words, the way that we discuss certain criminal acts, especially those done by more impressionable youth, could really affect individual psychology. If society thinks I'm a criminal and labels me as such, I will be more likely, according to my labeling theory, to perform criminal acts to fit my prescribed role. It will be easier for me to rationalize another murder if society labels me as a criminal or as a killer, cast me out to jail or prison, or sentence me to, sentences me to humiliating community service programs, or puts me on criminal registries and probation programs when I'm released from prison, or prevents me from getting legitimate formal sector employment due to my criminal past, and my name is printed in the papers as a former criminal, and so on and so forth. If all these things happen, I will think I am a criminal, just as society seems to think I am. Criminals break the law, and I will then be more likely to fulfill my role and perform as a criminal. Reinhold Pobbles' unlikely transfer from the Eastern Front to Italy in 1943 made him an incredibly lucky man. The Eastern Front produced a vast majority of German casualties during the war, and it is quite likely that he would have been killed, wounded, or captured as a POW if he had not been transferred for medical reasons. In December 1942, Pobble was stationed in Voronezh in the occupied USSR, when his bunker on the front flooded from thawing snow. This apparently gave him an ear infection, probably swimmer's ear, which I've had, and I know that it is not fun. <laughs> it, it sounds pretty lame, but it actually does really hurt. <laughs> I've never had it myself. <laughs> Pablo himself wrote that the ear infection probably did save his life. On January 5th, just as the Red Army troops in his area began to launch an offensive that successfully overran German lines and nearly encircled the region around that portion of the Don River that he was at, Pavel was put on a hospital train and was sent back to occupied Kiev in Soviet Ukraine. This was the last train to leave the station as the Red Army drew closer. We now know that this Soviet counteroffensive was part of a larger operation called Operation Little Saturn. Pavel witnessed the beginning of Axis retreat on, the, on his front just as he was leaving. Voronezh would be liberated by the Red Army barely two weeks after Pavel left the front. Before reaching Kiev, the train stopped at a different emergency hospital. Everyone who was on the train was screened by officers and those with lighter injuries were issued new un uniforms and sent right back to the front they just came from. Pavel's, new ear, was, uh, Pavel's ear was worked in, on in the hospital, but he was not sent back with them. Pavel was still in hospital when he learned that Marshal von Paulus's 6th Army at Stalingrad had been encircled and destroyed by the Red Army at the end of that month. He was put on a new train that, was sent, that went to Kiev, but did not get off there as the local occupation hospitals were already filled to the brim with Wehrmacht troops. Instead, the train pressed on back to Nuremberg, Germany. Pavel was considered for reassignment to Rommel's Africa Corps as he was recovering. He said he felt guilty about abandoning the, quote, real war in the East to go fight in Africa. To him, going to Africa was, quote, like having a picnic in the country while the house was on fire. Pavel would board a southbound train, but he would never make it to Africa. In the spring of 1943, the African Front was collapsing for the Axis. American and British troops had linked up in Tunisia and captured nearly a quarter million German and Italian troops. Instead, Pavel went to Sicily, where the Allies were expected to invade from North Africa. They did. Sicily was invaded, and Pavel was then sent to mainland Italy after Sicily fell. That October, Pavel sustained a chest injury and was taken as a prisoner by American troops. Within a few months, Pavel was on a Canadian ship, the Empress of Scotland, that was transporting him and other POWs across the Atlantic. He remembered the voyage as tough and uncomfortable, writing, quote, The sea is rough. Almost everybody is seasick. The air in our quarters is sticky and heavy with offensive odors. Our Italian fellow sufferers do not even attempt to reach the washroom when they have to sacrifice to the gods of the sea. You mean, it's urinating. They simply lean out of their hammocks. A pretty disgusting sight. I have implored a guard to bring me something to read. He did not answer. Apparently they have orders not to talk to us. They came ashore in Norfolk, Virginia on January 2nd, 1944. Pobble rode an army bus to Camp Grant in Rockford, Illinois, near the Wisconsin border. Though this camp was better than the facilities of his temporary camp in North Africa, better food, nicer shower facilities, 
etc. He would soon find this menial life of POW labor in America to be exhausting and boring, something many prisoners always do feel. Powell resented the restrictions prisoners are put under. One day, he was reading a copy of the Chicago Tribune he'd found when a guard snatched it from him and said, Where did you get this? You're not supposed to read that. When Powell writes here is particularly revealing of his mindset as a prisoner. Keep in mind, he, he wrote this book, this memoir, Enemies Are Human, 1955, two years after his capture by the FBI. Um, a girl report reporter asked me why I had escaped it at all in spite of the fact that I never had it so good. How could anybody ask such a question? The best food and relative security are no substitute for freedom. Only he who has lost it knows how precious freedom is. The POW has a natural impulse to escape from his barbed wire misery. Paul, Paul volunteered to do farm labor. He said the wide open fields and outdoor environment at least gave the illusion of freedom, and he got the opportunity to see things in actual American life. Paul remarked that uh, farmers and other local civilians in the countryside by Camp Grant were amicable and friendly to POWs. Sometimes even POW officers would have the task of babysitting at a camp officer's home for that officer's children. Powell wrote, Surely if all prisoners had been considered to be wicked Nazis, no officer's wife would have dared to entrust her babies to them. And keep in mind, this is um, written, this is taken directly from his memoir. Um, you should take everything, every direct quotation from him with a grain of salt, because it's from his perspective, and he might have a very jaded view on a lot of these events, especially what occurred during World War II, as we'll see. Fighting was common in the camp between prisoners, and once, prisoners actually sent a delegation to the commander of Camp Grant with a petition to establish a, quote, joy house at the camp. That is a brothel. The officer said American women could not be employed in such a way as it would give unlawful aid and comfort to the enemy. Pobble wood carved in camp as a hobby to combat boredom and hostility. One guard at the camp, whom he refers to simply as Mac, was anxious to get a prisoner-made souvenir. Pobble offered to sell his carving to him for five dollars. However, it was illegal for POWs to have American currency on hand. Mac was hesitant, but Pobble eventually won the argument by saying it was a souvenir for a souvenir, so that he could eventually show his family in Germany that he had been imprisoned in America during the war, and had American currency to back it up. Mac agreed, and Pobble got the five dollars. By the time he escaped, he'd slowly amassed fifteen dollars altogether. Today, that'd be over two hundred dollars. The intersection of Nazi psychology, soldiers' mentalities, and the revelation of the scale of German war crimes was interesting at Pobble's camp. After Powell was reassigned to Fort Sheridan in Lake County near the very end of the war, camp officers showed their POWs footage of the Buchenwald concentration camp. Powell wrote, On our way home and in the barracks, whenever the movie was mentioned, the men either declared it a fake or said, Why the hell did they show that to us? We didn't do it. Powell's writing seems to reinforce his conception of at least of a clean Wehrmacht, at least from his perspective, a well-known World War II myth that regular armed forces in Germany did not carry out war crimes and were entirely separate from the ideological trappings of Nazism and its organizations like the SS. We do, kn we do know for a fact that the Wehrmacht was complicit in war crimes, especially on the Eastern Front in occupied USSR and as well occupied Yugoslavia and other nations in Eastern Europe. Nazism still lived as a practicing ideology in the POW camps. Pavel writes that in February 1945, some party men in the camp held a pre-victory celebration in the barracks. These men talked about big secret weapons and strategies Germany still had that they hadn't used yet and that the Fuhrer would not let us down, direct quote. Near the end of the war, the U.S. Army began accepting applications from POWs for transfer to new ideologically driven anti-Nazi camps where they'd be given courses on democracy, liberalism, anti-fascism, and other types of political re-education. Pavel writes that, quote, Whenever somebody hinted he might consider joining these groups, they were usually given a holy ghost, German army slang for a severe group beating. Some murders and suicides would actually occur in many of these camps due to the ideological drift between Nazi fanatics and disillusioned, non-fascist German soldiers. It's important to say that uh, Pavel might have a jaded perception of how World War II went from the Axis perspective, but he was never a member of the Nazi party. As the war ended in Europe, American camp guards began to treat German prisoners more harshly than they had during uh, hostilities. The reasoning being that German camps would treat American POWs poorly if Americans did the same to German POWs. With American POWs now freed and occupied Germany, that fear no longer existed, and American camp guards had basically free reign over German prisoners. Babel was transferred again to Camp Ellis in Fulton County, where he says all non-coms, non-commissioned officers, were made to volunteer, in quotes, for work or else. That's an international war crime. Uh, you can't force POWs to do forced labor. At least you couldn't at the time, but a lot of things in World War II were war crimes, obviously. Pavel says American camp guards forced a diet of herring and milk on those who did not volunteer. And his reasoning was, well, I'm allergic to herring, so I guess I'll volunteer. 
Around this time, just as the war was ending, he resolved that he wanted to escape from the camp and go on the lam. He considered waiting it out and getting sent home to Germany, but he did not want to go home to take part in the post-war chaos in occupied Germany and starve while the Morgenthau plan was carried out by foreigners. He also feared that he could be loaned out by the U.S. military to do forced labor in France or Britain as a form of reparations, which sounded also entirely unpleasant. Thus, he began preparing for his own E-Day, Escape Day. The United States, together with the Canadian government, managed several hundred thousand German POWs in camps that were coordinated between the two countries throughout the war. When Pablo arrived in the United States, he was one of the over 400,000 Axis POWs that would cycle through the country during these years. The vast majority of these, some 87%, or about 371,000 Germans by the most common estimates, with most of the rest being Italian POWs. A very small amount of Japanese would also be taken prisoner, about 5,000, as Japanese imperial troops generally fought to the death or committed mass suicides rather than endure the shame of surrender. Conditions in these camps really varied. As you heard from Grant earlier, Pobble's story, uh, but Pobble's story is not really necessarily uh, indicative of the broader conditions across camps. Some would have relatively calm and pleasant experiences in, in the camps, while for others, the camps were a hell on earth. The camps are interesting not just from the inside, but from the outside as well. Small towns across the U.S. had surges of hundreds or thousands of German prisoners that arrived at hastily built prison camps virtually overnight. The sudden arrival of the enemy resulted in often permanent change for many of these small towns that found the consequences of the war suddenly dropped on their doorsteps uh, of the sleepy denizens. Prisoner of war camps were managed by the Provost Marshal General's Office, the same office that managed the Japanese internment camps and other internment camps for so-called enemy aliens. Amy C. Hudnall, a history professor at Appalachian State University, informs us that the planning for the American POW camps didn't even really begin until 1940, a year before the U.S. entered the war, but after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December 41. The camps were built without consideration of the fact that the POWs were not all Nazis. Many Germans had been conscripted to fight, others were devout Nazis, and some felt that they were fighting for the fatherland or another vague idea of the nation in a crude World War I-style nationalism or another idea of nationhood, while others were Russians or captured Eastern Europeans and Slavs and other ethnicities and nationalities forced by the Nazis to fight in the Wehrmacht. The Americans, however, generally treated all POWs the same as, as Nazis, at least initially. So uh, I mentioned a category of prisoners that was like World War I-style nationalist. I would, I would argue that Pablo was probably one of the, a member of this camp. Right. When the first fighting began in 1941 and 1942 in Africa and Italy for the Americans, uh, they didn't understand then that most of the prisoners that they were going to start getting were members of the Africa Corps, the legendary forces of General Erwin Rommel, one of the most fervently Nazi groups in the whole of the Wehrmacht. It was members of the Africa Corps who were in the first waves of German POWs to come to America. Upon their defeat in Africa in 1943, some 135,000 Germans streamed to the U.S. and Canada as POWs. So these init this initial wave was mostly Nazi, and it was this initial wave of POWs that reinforced the American perception that, okay, all the rest of our prisoners were getting well, be just as fervent Nazis, and that actually is really not yeah. the case. I'm guessing the Eastern Front force probably had a larger larger like conscription pool of just regular Germans that were told to go fight. Yeah, I imagine so, especially with how the war starts to go towards the end, when Hitler's recruiting old men and young boys to go fight. I imagine many of those were not fervent Nazi supporters, as many as were in the elite corps of Rommel's in mm -hmm. Africa. It was U.S. policy in the camps, meanwhile, to let the prisoners run the camps largely by themselves. As the historian Hudnall po points out, this was a policy reflected by the structures of the camps themselves as well, the physical layout. American officers and armed guards occupied tents and buildings on the perimeter of the camp with a final exterior fence between them and the outside world. Between the guards and the prisoners, however, was another fence, or a series of fences. At the very center, the German POWs were left inside the camp mostly by themselves on a large plot of land. The prisoners used their old hierarchies from the Wehrmacht to set up the camp order, determining the daily regimen, the scheduling of activities, the construction of different buildings, and so on, and daily life in general. Uh, all this was then determined by the old officer corps of the German armies. Since most of the officer class, especially in that first wave of Africa Corps prisoner, were Nazis, this means that it was largely Nazis who were in control of camp daily life, even if they formed only a small minority of certain camp POW populations. 
This was coupled with the fact that, again, most in the first wave of prisoners to arrive were from the intensely Nazified Africa Corps, meaning that these prisoners were the first to set up camp life and that these prisoners, being the first to arrive in most of these camps, really came and immediately entrenched themselves in the power structures and would stay there for a lot of the duration of these POW camps, most of which lasted until 1946, a year after the war ended. The U.S. government would estimate that in 1944, in a study, uh, that 10 to 15 percent of their German prisoners were hardcore Nazis, while the other 85 to 90 percent of them were other. A uh, pretty broad category. In a more specific British study, Hudnall points out, uh, 11 percent were said to be hardcore Nazis, 9 percent were fervent anti-Nazis, some 15 percent were divided and passive anti-Nazis, 25 percent were nearly Nazis, and 40 percent the rest were classified as apolitical. This meant that camp schools, mail systems, social life, and more were dictated from above by Nazis, though, all this. Uh, prisoners who were not fervent anti-Nazis, or excuse me, prisoners who were not fervent Nazis, or who were anti-Nazi conscripts, especially non-Aryan conscripts from Eastern Europe or uh, other minority mm -hmm. populations, were then subject to terrible violence should they resist the Nazi camp policies. The Nazis were in control of the camps. If you resisted them, uh, your daily life mm -hmm. could be affected as well. There were numerous instances of beatings, stabbings, and other camp violence, violence that we heard about from Pavel's story, and violence that was usually due to Nazi attacks on whoever they perceived to be their political enemies or their racial or ethnic enemies as well, according to their, their terrible, messed up, warped ideology. The violence, however, was usually shrouded from the public due to the literal walls and fences that kept the prisoners hidden from view in the first, as well as the fact that the POWs maintained kind of a facade of outward order and strict military discipline in their camps. Yeah. Interestingly, Pablo kind of went a little bit against uh, that sort of like Nazi ideology, which made people kind of think a little more differently of him because he would talk to American colored troops mm -hmm. when even many white troops in the U.S. Army wouldn't talk to them mm -hmm. um, beyond very basic uh, need. Yeah, and we, we say colored, that's that's what they were called at yeah. the time. That's not our words, so just pointing that out. Um, but yes, the I think that's interesting too. There was a paper I read or uh, scammed, I, I don't remember the author's name, unfortunately, but it was talking about how African Americans who were seeing the conditions that uh, Nazi prisoners were being treated as were very, very upset, especially in the South and the Jim Crow South, because, you know, African Americans living in a small town, say in Louisiana, would look over and see Nazi prisoners having steak dinners and having very nice full cooked meals. Right. Well, nice, they live under Jim life. Crow, yeah. Exactly. And so uh, African Americans were very pissed off in, and other people of color, too, in America at the time, and, and women who are treated just as second-rate citizens. If you weren't a white man in America in the 1940s, then you were treated as a second-rate citizen, and that's a fact. Mm -hmm. um, everybody who wasn't a white man was kind of very upset at the way that Nazis, the enemy, had it so easy in camps, uh, a little aside. Um, but it's important to note, too, that as we were talking about the violence, uh, to get back to that, the violence in these camps was kind of further facilitated. So not only did the Nazis have this allusion to the outside world of order and discipline, they also have this literal protection of fences that makes it hard for people to find out what's going on, and the camps are pretty secretive under military control. Uh, last, uh, that kind of facilitated the violence in the camps by the Nazis was the fact that, as the historian Amy C. Hudnall points out, a lot of the guards and staffers hired for camp duty were very undertrained and were oftentimes considered to be the worst elements of the American army. These staffers were people uh, often who were uh, coming back from the front with disabilities or people who had bad records in the army. You know, they would send just their worst elements uh, to go staff these camps, meaning that a lot of the staffers then were not too eager to be keep keeping much of a close eye on things in general. Yeah, uh, a good example of that uh, happened in July 1945 at a POW camp in Utah. Mm -hmm. um, a U.S. Army private who was camp guard uh, just went up to the sentry tower one night when he was drunk and got out his Browning automatic rifle and just shot at the tents while Germans slept below him. And he shot 29 people and killed uh, nine of them, I think. Yeah, it's it's like really incredible, actually, kind of, especially because I think actually in, in doing some of my preliminary research, I think the broad idea is that Americans treated Nazi POWs like really well. Yeah. And to some extent they did, but there's a much more complex picture we need to paint as historians, and that's indeed of little stories like that or of the terrible violence uh, afflicted by Nazis to non-Nazi prisoners in the POW camps themselves. 
uh, conditions really varied. So, yeah. you know, while some Germans might have wrote, written romantic letters years later and romanticized their time in America because they did have a good time, others had it really, yeah. really bad. Yeah, an interesting counter stat. Um, I believe after World War II ended, um, the out of the German POWs that were in Canadian camps, one mm-hmm. out of every five of them applied for Canadian citizenship when the war was over because they thought Canadian guards treated them very nice and that Canada was beautiful. Yeah, and I think by contrast, only a few thousand Germans would come back to live in America afterwards out of the massive prison population of several hundred thousand, uh, which is less than 5%, mm-hmm. I should say, um, <laughs> if, I, if my math is correct there. I'm a historian first, a mathematician <laughs> is a distant second. Uh, but again, to speak more on the violence, uh, it's amplified further even more by the fact that uh, people who would try and resist the Nazis, again, the Nazis are in control of most of camp daily life, daily regimen, they control the food, the mail system, entertainment, uh, most everything. So even if you wanted to resist this, that's why so many people were passive, right? And those stats are reported earlier, like 40% were just apolitical. Yeah, alternative you, was getting beat up or possibly yeah. killed. Yeah. And if it wasn't that, it was you just didn't have any type of social life in the camp, too. So that's everything was controlled by the Nazis for a lot of these camps. I couldn't find any stats on how many camps were controlled, but uh, most of the historians I was reading, especially Hudnall, uh, emphasize this fact that Nazis really did control the camps, at least for the first year or two, when most of the prisoners were Africa Corps. Uh, and then they get, in the, they get in the power and the camps, and then they remained in power because they controlled everything and there was no way to oppose them. And American troops weren't going to do anything about it either. The Nazi-controlled camps, uh, especially those controlled by the Africa Corps, though, didn't really inflict terror on their Nazi, or excuse me, on their anti-Nazi or apolitical counterparts for purely political and power reasons, however. Uh, The University of Exeter historian Matthias Rice has shown how Africa Corps soldiers were also intensely concerned about their images of masculinity as well. He brings gender into play. When previous historians have assumed that the process of being turned into a POW was incredibly emasculating, uh, and that repatriation and release of POWs after the war's end was remasculating, Rice actually complexifies this picture with the case of Germany's Africa Corps. So the Africa Corps POWs, the same who were usually in charge of POW life, as I said, uh, maintained their masculine image throughout the war, which is kind of in contrast to the general idea. Before the war, they had a reputation, uh, Rice notes, as being the toughest troops in the German army. As Grant said, they're they're legendary, and there's so many movies made about them, and Rommel, yeah. you know, the, the Desert Fox, yeah. right? I think Rommel is the only German field marshal in World War II who gets regularly romanticized in Western nations yeah, today. Right. Like, uh, if you've met any middle-aged dad in the United States who is interested in World War II, they're probably interested in Rommel specifically uh-huh. as well. And that's... The pertinent image, if it was, it's big today. It was big back then too, and yeah. that America got actually pretty badly beaten. The first few battles we had in North yeah. Africa, Kasserine Pass. Um, uh-huh. exactly. Yeah, the, the Germans just handed the Americans ass to them, basically. Yeah, and so <laughs> there was this pervasive image, at least early on in the war, that would be maintained by the press and everything of almost a genius. And- yeah. And of everybody in the Africa Corps who came over as a POW being this big, tall, burly, very strong, masculine German who's an impossible foe to defeat in combat. Mm -hmm. Um, And this image was maintained uh, by, again, their strict discipline in the camps and also by the fact that Nazis controlled the camps. And so they had a very, like a very powerful exterior image. So people like the small town Kansas farmer who would look over at the camp and see these big, tall, burly, tanned, bronze and Germans working in the sun all day would be intimidated. They've been living in Algeria, Tunisia for at least a year or so. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And so contrary to what you would think as, you know, considering this from gender lens, you'd think that just every POW experience would be emasculating. Africa Corps soldiers in particular really actually maintained their masculine image throughout. And that was also, I think, part of the way that Africa Corps soldiers were able to become the dominating figures of most of the prison Especially camps. If, if you're under Rommel's command in North Africa, it's supposed to be the theater where bravado is supposed to show through. Exactly right. And so people coming from the Eastern Front where they're getting just destroyed, uh, German soldiers, I should say, that become POWs, uh, come and then they see the cream of the crop Africa Corps soldiers already in power. That, again reproduces the power structure when they say here are these very masculine people were the emasculated ones we were the ones defeated by the soviets the if you believe in nazi ideology too lesser race you know the slavic yeah. lesser race so gender is very important here too 
uh, as Rice works or as Rice notes too, uh, this is really interesting that it was maintained too because like Africa Corps soldiers will be doing work that was often women's work in the United States at the time. So they would go to canning factories or, you know, do field work or do work that was also for uh, minorities, right. uh, people of color. And so many millions of men are mobilized that uh, a huge portion of the industrial workforce is women during uh -huh. the war. And so that's what women's work was at the time, or that's what work was for people of color, too. And in America, again, being uh, a woman at this time or being a person of color is an emasculating experience. Uh, and so that's just fascinating to me, too, that, as Rice points out, Nazi workers were doing the same emasculating work but maintained their masculine image all the while. Very interesting. So as Rice writes in particular, quote, the German POWs successfully maintained their masculine soldierly image during their captivity in the U.S. by maintaining military drill and discipline, publicly expressing their heterosexual desires, and by creating the illusion, too, of fe a female presence in the camps. Yeah. Hence the joy house that they wanted to set up at Camp Grant. Exactly, right. Um, so Rice really shows then in an interesting way how gender is much more difficult to pin down in the case of POWs and is much more fluctuating than one might think. You really need to actually investigate it. You can't just blindly assume that certain experiences are emasculating. You have to contextualize it historically, which we love to do on the People's History Hour. So uh, at first then I should note too that most of the prisoners were not used for labor. Uh, this changed as Barbara Schmitter Heisler's article on the experience of German POWs who immigrated to the U.S. after their captivity. Uh, her article informs us that initially the Provost Marshal General's office, again that's the office in control of the POW camps, saw almost all of the prisoners, at least at first, as more of a security problem than as a labor force. Even though using POWs as a labor force was legal under the Geneva Convention of 1929, provided you don't uh, threaten them with uh, only serving them herring or milk, yeah. as Pavel claims, uh, even though it's legal to use prisoners as a labor force, prisoners of war, uh, they viewed them initially just all these Nazis, especially when the first wave was just only Africa Corps Nazis, you know, very, very, again, masculine, uh, Nazified, intensely Nazified figures. They viewed all these people as a security threat. They're like, we're just going to keep them in their camps, let them do what they want. If they want to do their drills, that's fine. But as the war dragged on, and especially as preparation for uh, D-Day began, they said, okay, we can really use this force of hundreds of thousands as an added boon to our labor force. And they started to in 1943. Yeah, as long as it's um, something that doesn't have something directly to do with making war armaments. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you couldn't force them to work on an aircraft carrier that was going to go across the yeah. ocean and kill their allies. <laughs> That's why Pobble uh, worked, for instance, in a canning factory yeah. rather than in a weapons factory. Yeah, just um, putting cans of corn together. Some of them will go to the front and yeah. some will be for domestic sale. Totally. And so that's the context then uh, of the camps. That's the broader context of the camps that Pobble was in in 1944 as a German POW in the United States. Mm -hmm. So as I said, uh, Pobble writes that in his camp the tension was rising after the end of the war. And you'd assume that it would fall after the end of the war, but said camp guards got worse. Guards were more abusive, factionalism and the infighting uh, between the prisoners, Nazi versus anti-Nazi, apolitical, was elevating. And he still felt the yearning everyone has at some idea of personal liberty. Uh, he wrote that uh, it doesn't matter how good the prison is, it's still a prison at the end of the day. Pavel carefully planned his escape for a couple of months. He was able to get about $15 together, make his clothing look as normal and not prisoner-like as possible right before escape, including he dyed his trousers to fade out the PW on his left buttock, I believe, which means prisoner of war. The tattoo, right? What? It was, was it a PW tattoo? No, no, it was just like dyed, like stitched into oh, the pants, and okay. he dyed it to like fade yeah. it out. He'd also read J. Edgar Hoover's article on how enemy prisoners are recaptured from American Magazine. He memorized it forward and back and used its rules and tactics to judge what he should not do on escaping. He figured that he must go alone to, as to not attract attention. It's easier to take two or three guys down than one. Mm -hmm. um, don't talk more than necessary, as he still had a German accent, although he was pretty much fluent by English in English by this point. Um, get away as far as possible, as quickly as possible, and have some cash on hand. Pobble saw the opportunity had arrived, and he was transferred to one of Camp Ellis's branch camps in Washington, Illinois, the beginning of September 1945. Prisoners were there to do forced labor for the corn harvesting season and to can the corn at the local Libby canning factory, which is still in use. Um, the work is menial and backbreaking, and Pobble knows that the city of Peoria is not that far from use of a forbidden Illinois roadmap he possesses. Oh, yeah, POWs also couldn't have atlases or maps of any part of the United States because uh, it would aid their escape, like in his mm -hmm. case it did. 
Um, just a couple of weeks after transferring to Washington, Pavel decided that his plan, Operation Vapor, was a go, his E-Day. In the middle of the September night, Pavel packed his belongings together in an army duffel bag, crawled out his tent, and waited for the night guard's spotlight to go elsewhere and hop the fence. No one had seen him. He was technically free. Do we know why he called it Operation Vapor? I don't know, actually. Yeah. I think he me- might mention it in the book. I think it might have something to do with, like, a German meaning of the yeah. word. Um, or maybe it's, like, vapor, like, disappears into thin air or something yeah. like that. Or maybe it just sounds yeah. cool. It's a cool word. Other, <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's a nice name for an operation. My other uh, point I wanted to make, too, is that it's interesting. According to, I think it's uh, the New York Review of Books reviewed – or no, it's Time Magazine, excuse me. When his book comes out in 55, Time Magazine reviews it and writes about his story. And they reported, I don't know if he mentioned this in his book, but they reported that Pavel saw this article by J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, when he was on garbage truck duty. It was in the pile of garbage, and yep. he saw the article, and he's yep. like, all right, I'm He said I'm the guard wasn't that. looking, so he took it, quickly put it in his pocket. Yeah, stuffed and he it said in. later that night he read it when he was alone in the barracks. Yeah, and that, I think that's just incredibly ironic, too, because Hoover wrote this article like in this American Interest magazine. I guess he figured... That aimed at the army it's like yeah. hey there's a lot of pow's <laughs> escaping yeah. you can you can decrease it by looking for this stuff <laughs> yeah and that's a good point too that actually there were a lot of pow escapes there were several thousand of them that escaped during the war almost all of them except for like six get caught yeah um except there's one really interesting case of georg gartner that's his name right? george gartner i believe uh and he never got caught. And he yeah. finally just went to a historian um, out in the 1980s. Yeah, right? and he's yeah. like, hey, uh, I'm an escape POW and no one ever caught me. You want And then he wrote a book about it. Yeah. <laughs> and you said, like, his wife left him after that, right? Because I believe so. he had lied to her all that time, yeah. of course. It's understandable. Um, but, yeah, th- I think it's just very ironic that Hoover writes this article in American Magazine and trying to help out the Army and be like, here's what we should be doing, here's what citizens can be doing to catch these escaped POWs. And then Pavel reads it and he's like, all right, here's what I should not do if I don't want to end up like these guys who got caught. And Pavel's one of the last recaptured POWs yeah. <laughs> because and of it. It's funny. it's funnier still because then Hoover, like in the next issue of the Mer- magazine, American Magazine, he writes like a follow-up and he's like, all right, since I wrote that last article and I mentioned these guys who were on the lam, uh, we caught them. We caught some of these people. And as he's like writing that, Pavel has read his article and escaped because of it. So the irony is compounded in very many layers. <laughs> Indeed. Poor Hoover. Yeah. Poor, incredibly right wing <laughs> FBI director who I despise. ran the intelligence community for five decades. Hoover. Yeah. <laughs> Hoover is not a good guy. Yeah. Although the movie J. Edgar with Leo DiCaprio is pretty good. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Pavel began to hitchhike to Peoria with an old farmer giving him a ride. Farmer complained to Pavel about Roosevelt and his perceived authoritarianism to be president for life. His farmer's telling Pavel that he thinks, like, Roosevelt maneuvered and set up World War II the way it <laughs> happened so that he could get a third and fourth term. Um, and Pavel found himself vaguely defending Roosevelt, which he uh, found strange as he, a uh, German soldier, had no love lost for the American president, obviously. Uh, opposing sides of the war. Uh, so the farmer didn't like that he was, like, telling him, like, <laughs> like yeah. And it's like, what, you some kind of Roosevelt fan? <laughs> and, <laughs> and he threatened to actually kick him out of the car. <laughs> because he liked Roosevelt? Yeah. I oh, guess yeah. yeah. I guess, uh, I guess the farmer's a Wendell Wilkie or a Dewey man. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is, like, 1944, right? Yep. May. Yeah, 45. 45, my bad. Yeah, fall of 45. So... Pablo was dropped off at the bus depot in Peoria by the farmer. Apparently, they defused the Roosevelt thing, uh, <laughs> where he bought his ticket to Peoria. Uh, his thrill took off when he sat down at the bus and saw it beginning to move out of the city. He wrote, quote, I made it. Six hours from now, I shall be in Chicago, and I will step out a new man, a civilian, a normal human being. I listen to the purring melody of the tires on the open highway. They sing, freedom, freedom. As he nears Chicago, he's terrified the police will be at the depot in the loop waiting for him to get off. Pablo wrote that he re- remembered not being able to find a place to sleep and could not waste that l- little money he had on a hotel. He tried sleeping in the park, but it was too crowded and had police. He tried sleeping in the seat of an all-night theater, but the usher kept waking him up and made to prevent homeless people from doing exactly that. Pablo, in a few days, got a job as a dishwasher at a Greek restaurant in the city. Um, only 50 cents an hour, but free meals on the job, and he worked 1 to 9 in the evenings. Pablo was also able to rent a small men's room in a hostel. Something to note is that he rented this room at three seventy-five a week and was making four dollars a day. Pablo's living costs were just about ten percent of his income, which is uh, 
interesting to think about <laughs> how different the uh, housing costs in the 40s and 50s were. Another interesting thing you said, too, is about, like, his Social Security card, too, and how yeah. he's able to get that. It's so easy to get a Social Security card, like, under a false identity. Um, so he adopts the name Phil. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Mm. Adopts the name Phil. His reasoning was that uh, he got actually through his first shift at this place, this Greek restaurant, and the guy still didn't know his name. And so he's like, hey, man, I never got your name after he just worked eight hours <laughs> for him. Um, <laughs> and so he decided on Phil because it's a name with, a, with some Greek origin to it. And uh, it sounds both German and English. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a very versatile European name. And after having to get a social security card, basically, uh, after his first week, the guy's like, hey, man, I need your social security card. And Pavel kept dodging it because he didn't have one. He wasn't even entirely certain how to get one or what exactly it did. Um, but uh, he was threatened to be fired if he like didn't get it by the following Friday or something like that. So he went down to the social security office, and he was terrified of getting caught in this government building. He actually went up to the office on the elevator, Walked out, saw the office, got back on the elevator, went back down to the first floor, and then <laughs> took like a walk around and like tried to like clear his senses. And then he's like, okay. And then he went back up and walked into the office. And um, he also adopted the name Brick on the spot from an advertisement that he saw. Um, so a new identity was created, and he walked out with a social security card. Mm. He was an American in that sense, and that he had a state document that only Americans have. You're, you're saying he like saw the advertisement like on the wall. That reminds me of like the Usual Suspects. Yeah, or You've like a magazine yeah. like on the table or something. It yeah. was something like that. I don't know exactly like, where he saw. While it. he's being, that's like the Usual Suspects, the movie. You know, <laughs> like he's like in the room and he's just looking at things in the room to make up his story. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, Philip Brick. He's like, oh, that sounds fine. That, <laughs> that sounds, sounds like normal. A name. Yeah. Um. So he walked out with his social security card and he like he realized hey i have the social security card now i can get a now i can get a job anywhere and so he went back to the greek restaurant he really just started out and he told the guy to stick it and he quit and um he got a job as a dishwasher at another restaurant that paid a little better tried doing pin setting in a bowling alley but uh he said his first day there was like a bowling like league championship game or something and he couldn't keep up with it and so he just did the one shift and he's like that's enough of that (laughs) um he worked at uh, a restaurant called martha's as a dishwasher for some time for almost a, but almost a year, um, and then from there he became a bookstore clerk, um, and uh, was able to save enough money that he opened his own small bookstore, which expanded to a larger one on the north side. He met and married one of his customers, and uh, he had two children with her. He started a life, a family. Finally, one day, 1953, a man walked into the store, looking quite suspicious to Philip Brick. He asked for a copy of Schulman's Zebra Derby and eyed him closely. He's like, yeah, here you go. And uh, he looked at it for a second, and like he said he was just studying his face, which he thought was strange. And then he's like, I'll just wait till it comes out uh, on paperback. And then he walks out of the store, and he's like, oh, that was weird. And then a few hours later, he and uh, seven other suited men, I have eight on the dock, but it's actually seven, eight together, mm-hmm. uh, came back in all in suits and hats, not a good sign. <laughs> and uh, they asked him a simple question at the counter. Are you Reinhold Pavel? Pavel relents and says he is. He's arrested, telephones his wife, tells, tells her he won't be home, and his trial ensues. This story is kind of personal to Grant and I because, as we mentioned, uh, Pablo escaped from Washington, Illinois, and was interned there for two weeks. And I didn't really know that there was a prisoner of war camp in our hometown that housed, I think it was something like 246 prisoners yeah. at its height at the Libby Canning Factory, it was called. Um, so it's kind of personal to us. It's also personal to me. Because when I was in the fourth grade, I remember my teacher told us a story about an escaped German POW named Philip Brick. And if my memory from, it would have been 2006 or 2007. Uh, now everybody knows my age, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm uh, actually 35. <laughs> no, um, if I remember correctly from 2006 or 2007, a long time ago, uh, my teacher in fourth grade said that when he escaped, he saw a pile of bricks and on the spot decided that that would be his alias. In actuality, as you heard, that's not really what happened. Um, he saw the advertisement in the office of the Social Social Security Department and used that. Uh, but regardless, like this story has been in the back of my mind for a long time, so I was very astonished that like when we started researching it, I remembered all these details all of a sudden. 
And I remember, too, that I used to play and live as a kid right near that canning factory in Washington, Illinois, where Pobble worked mm-hmm. for a time. Yeah, and we we, went, we did had the different junior high schools that we went to. Mm-hmm. But I do remember that we had to do some Washington history project and social studies. And Washington's a very, very, very boring town, so there's not that much to write about. And so uh, the POW camp is one of those things to write about. Yeah, so kids, if you're listening from Washington... We gave you our history topic. Um, also, the Living Canning Factory is, if you know where Kuri's uh, Lebanese restaurant in Washington is, it's like two blocks south of that on Wood Street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's like in between the cemetery and like by Lindy's and everything, uh, Washington. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, see, you can tell from the tone <laughs> of my voice that uh, it's personal to us. And Only I was, Washington kids will get this. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> we'll share it just to them. We'll do the Facebook advertisement just in their area. Um but yeah, I, I was just blown away when I started reading about Pobble and the cannery in my own hometown, and it was just very interesting to me that something of, of such historical significance, a POW camp less than a mile from where I used to live for years as a kid, existed under my nose the whole time. And so I really do kind of have, it's not that change, but it just, I feel like I have a greater knowledge of how my town even came to be, because again, some of these German POWs would come back and live in Washington, and their interactions with people of Washington and their influence on the culture, and the fact that there was prisoners of war staying there, really did sit and inform how Washington developed historically, as it did to a lot of these other small towns across the United States, the mainland U.S., during the war. And so I think that's just very neat, and I encourage everybody, too, to uh, look up who's listening and learn about there are probably POW camps near your hometown, too, or near where you grew up that you didn't know about, and I didn't know about it. There were something like over 500 camps in the United States during the war total, and they were everywhere. So I encourage you to look it up and find out about your own that was nearby you. Just fascinating. Back to Klein and labeling theory. In 1986, Malcolm Klein, our sociologist that we were talking about at the beginning of the program, published an article in the journal Criminal Justice and Behavior about labeling theory. It was a study of 306 juveniles and how their interactions with law enforcement after their initial release for various first offenses increased their likelihood to recidivate. Remember, we were talking about how Klein had discovered in his earlier research on gang activity in the 1960s, published in his 1971 book, uh, that he discovered that the more that the gang identified as a gang, the more that they self-labeled and accepted the label of society, that they were gang members, the more they would perform and act like a gang. So he takes this concept of labeling theory, and he starts to explore it more deeply in this paper, in this study published in 1986. So his 306 juveniles, uh, he takes them, and these are people who have already committed a first offense. So he takes them, and they are randomly selected to go into different release, community treatment, and court petition programs. So some of these 306 juveniles went to criminal justice programs, uh, you know, state-run and funded programs to get them out of basically doing any further criminal activity. You know, think of like juvie programs. Uh, And some went into private social service worker programs. So they would go to like, you know, certain charity programs or certain social work programs, most of them privately funded again, but some receiving state funding. Uh, Others were petitions to go to juvenile court. And some of them, I believe, were also petitioned to go into community service. And others still were released outright. Uh, Again, this is a randomly selected group, each uh, group of, like, I don't know what 306 divided by 4 is off the top of my head. But that many people uh, were going into these different groups. In interviews with some of these juveniles, then, that he conducts months later and his team conducts a few months later, nine months later, uh, after... They've been sent into these various programs, and then that other fourth group is released. Klein and his research team gave them questionnaires, asking them how well they thought certain phrases applied to them. Uh, Rates of rearrest were studied, and social networks of the juveniles were noted. Juveniles are asked to list the number of times that they had performed illegal actions from a list of 18 different items and categories. Other factors are analyzed, too. And the goal of all this analysis and all these different modes of of research and interviewing, uh, whether to assess the disposition or the displacement, the way that those studies, those studied uh, seem to have their arrest and placement into programs, their label affect their recidivism. And the other two factors measured ultimately were label encapsulation and label acceptance. Encapsulation was how social circles and contacts of those juveniles that had been arrested initially how these people were affected to accept the label and reproduce it. Uh, 
And label acceptance, that was the term that Klein used to mean how individuals themselves, the juveniles themselves, accepted and took on the label of criminal or gang member or what have you, or delinquent. The paper, as you probably can guess, is really, really complicated, and it's full of really precise terminology and webs of graphs and data. I don't really pretend to understand all of it, as I'm no sociologist myself, and not really a social scientist e either, after having read this. You know, there's a debate about whether historians are social scientists or humanities majors. Uh, after reading a real social scientist's paper, I'm not sure if I'm a social scientist, but uh, conversation for another day. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't pretend to understand all of this paper. Uh, Malcolm Klein, if you happen to ever hear this program, I'm sorry if I get it wrong, please correct us. But I do think I get the conclusion of the paper. Klein and his research team basically found, in essence, as a result of the study of hundreds of juvenile delinquents and the labels that they apply to themselves and how others think of them and how their experiences in the justice system or private uh, private social service work uh, influenced them and how they thought of themselves, Klein and his research team conclude that while, while there was a difference between recidivism rates and rearrest rates between people who were sent into private social service work, the criminal justice system itself, juvie, uh, people who were petitioned to go to criminal juvenile court, or people who were released outright. Uh, there was a small difference between recidivism rates, but it wasn't significant. People in all four of these programs and categories and the people who were released outright actually had very similar and comparable recidivism rates. They were rearrested at about the same rate over this nine-month period. Where there was a difference, uh, the only category in which there was a difference was in the category of people who were just released outright. The, uh, the people who were released outright had a notably lower recidivism rate, actually, than people who were put back into the criminal justice system. So, in other words, uh, Klein's tentative conclusion, that's what he calls it, but I think it's actually a pretty well argued and supported one, is that the more that people attempted to put folks back into the justice system after a first offense, the more that people try to put folks into preventative programs, the more that they actually made people into criminals. That was the only strong conclusion he could draw from his study, was that uh, labels regardless, uh, people develop labels the most when they were put into the justice system in any fashion, and that's all you can say about labels, was that if they get put into the justice system in any fashion, it's the justice system and the state that labeled them. Uh, and once they were l released, they didn't really think of themselves as criminals anymore because they didn't get arrested as much. That's the evidence for that. Hobble Indeed. will get tried in 1953, and we're going to tie that sociology to the man now yeah. after Grant can speak kind of off the cuff about it. Yeah, that. real quick, I'd like to talk about just a couple incidents that happened to Pobble in Chicago while he was mm -hmm. living as Philip Brick that kind of speak to uh, his consistent fear of getting caught of having his liberty taken away from him and being re-imprisoned. There was one day where he was going to work at Martha's Restaurant. On, it's on North Clark, it was on North Clark Street in Chicago. And uh, he was walking up, and he saw through the window a police officer talking to the cashier at the, at the till, and uh, he was gesturing wildly at her. And uh, he thought, oh, God, like, I'm, I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get sent back to prison. And so he actually stayed outside and really thought about just running, like mm -hmm. just dropping everything, uh, leaving. He thought, do I go back? Do I pack things um, back at his uh, room in that men's apartment, like slash hostel? And he decided to finally brave up and go in, and it turns out they were just talking about Cubs versus White Sox. Um, yeah. There was one day where uh, he was still wearing, remember those PW pants that he dyed? The dye started to fade after a little while. And uh, one day, one of his co-workers, uh, this lady that worked in the back uh, washing with him, I think he said it was a black woman, uh, they were talking, and she's like, hey, hey, what's that weird pattern you got? And it was the P from the PW, like, mm -hmm. actually coming back to be visible again. And he's like, oh, that's improper for a woman to ask a gentleman, isn't it? And then he, like, walked to the bathroom, and he, like, tried to, like, tear out the threading. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> uh, that's just... It's uh, really fascinating. And this uh, little excerpt I found very interesting because like, it speaks to, like, probably how, like, I'm sure charming he came across. Sometimes when people understood his accent as weird or foreign, it gradually left, but sometimes people would say, that's a weird accent you mm -hmm. got. He would start telling people the story of how he was a Dutch refugee. Um, really? Yeah, he's like, Philip, Philip, yeah. yeah, Philip Brick. And he's like, German, Dutch accent that sounds the same to American ears. Uh, I'll tell people I'm Fast. from the Netherlands. And if people try to ask about my background, I'll say it's too painful to talk about. <laughs> and that happened a few times. 
mm-hmm. um, which I guess is pretty intelligent of him. But he um, went uh, to the dentist once uh, to uh, get his teeth fixed because they'd been neglected. He never saw any dental care since he joined the army in yeah. 1940, basically. Uh, this doctor, Dr. Woodman, uh, he says, quote, besides being an able dentist, was a very congenial conversation partner. Often I sat in his chair for a long time while we discussed political and linguistic problems. I remember him so well because he was unknowingly the indirect cause of an embarrassing moment in later years. A friend of his, a professor in some Middle Western university, had mentioned to him that he was scouting around for a few Russian interpreters to be employed by the government in Washington. Uh, Pavel did speak Russian uh, pretty well. He spoke like five languages, right? Yeah, he was, he was intellectual. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, following the doctor's suggestion, the professor soon visited me and asked if I would like to work for the government in such a position. <laughs> it pays very well, he assured, and then added, there are no strings attached except that the FBI will probably make a routine investigation, which, of course, would not bother you, would it? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course not. Why should it? I lied bravely, trying to conceal my shock under my an amused chuckle. Then politely declined the offer on the grounds that my linguistic qualifications might not be quite up to standards, and that I would like to spare myself the humiliation of flunking. That was a close one. Still, I was rather pleased with the idea of working for the federal government. Wouldn't have been such a joke of a well-nigh artistic perfection to secure such a job and have the FBI on my trail and be arrested at the Pentagon as a disguised prisoner of war. So, I think those little close encounters, at least in his mind, what he considers close encounters before he was actually caught years later, uh, kind of speak to that psychology of criminalism that he as an escaped prisoner has. Mm-hmm. A Dallas attorney named Paul Lindsay uh, heard of Pobble's arrest by the FBI because uh, it was all over national media, an escape POW for eight years. Like that, that got a lot of major media attention. Immediately announced uh, that Pobble had saved his life during the fighting on the Volturno in Italy and offered to help him in any feasible way. Pavel said he found himself lying wounded in a ditch and, um, and reassured him, and then, to keep from drawing U.S. artillery fire on the attorney's refuge, led a squad of Germans a hundred yards away. The attor- attorney was not the only one to go to Reinhold's assistance. His neighbors and his friends began telephoning him to offer their help as soon as they heard of his arrest, as well as another person um, from the Volterno in Italy. The president of a local neighborhoods association were to, went to Washington, wrote to Washington asking congressional leave for this unfortunate man. At week's end, Reinhold, free on a $1,000 bond, felt that it had some grounds on hoping that the government would allow him to settle down legally and became a citizen. They asked Eisenhower for clemency and things like that. Uh, it was a huge, huge when it went to trial. Um, he was t- supposed to be processed by Hoover's FBI after his arrest and then deported to West Germany, permanently probably. At his trial, uh, his real background was contrasted sharply with this new ad- adopted identity of Philip Brick that made him known as a masquerader in the media. And uh, Philip Brick was his identity. His identity had become that was what he associated freedom with. That mm-hmm. constructed identity for himself, uh, living as a uh, inconspicuous Chicago bookkeeper. So he got uh, his lawyer friend, uh, who he saved, who he basically said was saved him uh, in Italy. So he wasn't regarded as an illegal alien because he was legally taken into the U.S. by the U.S. military as a POW. Pavel got a compromise of being sent to Germany for six months and then being able to return to the U.S. after, in a trial that lasted about two years. While he was in Germany, Pavel wrote the book he wrote as a memoir, this one that we're using so much for info on the show, Enemies Are Human. He became an American citizen in time, and in time he had another bookstore, this one in his hometown, Hamburg. When he retired, his daughter took it over, Lucy Pavel. He retired in 1990, and in June 2008, he died at age 92 in Germany. So to conclude, I think, and tie the sociology back to this man, Reinhold Pobel, this escaped Wehrmacht convict, this POW, uh, I just have a few, like, kind of loose forum questions that I want to ask Grant. I'll try my best. (laughs) So Grant being the Pobel expert, the resident Pobel expert, he read most of the book and I focused on the sociology, and now we're going to tie the two together. Uh, how do you think that Pavel viewed himself during his time as an escapee? Do you think that he considered himself to be on the lam or to be a criminal as such? And do you think that this view of himself changed after he gets caught? So does he view himself on the lam? You talked about like his stories of even if he didn't view himself that way, there are constantly things happening during his day that was reminding him of the fact that right. he's... You're wanted. living a lie, basically. Yeah. Um, I think he did view himself as like con- consistently on the lam, mm-hmm. although... His um, worries about it dissipated over time. Yeah. Probably in the first few months, he was always on edge about it. And then a year went by, 
three years went by, five years, and then probably by the eighth year when he was captured, he was fully committed to his new life. He had a family and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that prisoner psychology gradually waned over time because he thought he had, he was in the clear and that the FBI had maybe stopped looking for him or just totally maybe moved his case as cold or something like that. That's, yeah, I think that yeah. that psychology as a, as a prisoner was dissipating, and I'm sure he didn't think he did anything wrong. He's like, I was conscripted into the Wehrmacht. I didn't. I wasn't complicit. And at least as he wrote, he claims that he wasn't complicit in any horrible thing that was done mm-hmm. by uh, Nazi Germany during the war, and that he was just fulfilling a basic human desire that everybody wants, which is personal liberty, freedom in an abstract sense. I think that's interesting, and I think that you're starting to get at like what I think is at the heart of this story, which is starting to bring it back to Malcolm Klein's papers, it's, it's about labels and categories and identities and group and uh, individual identities. Yeah. And um, I, th- I think that, uh, sorry, I'll ask my next question if that's right. Go uh, for it. I, th- I think that, um, I was going to say the term masquerader or escapee yeah, or, right. or convict or prisoner, like those all play into that. Exactly. That's like his identity that's being forced on him from above. And you said that you thought it dissipated over time. And I think that like, it probably dissipated over time too in in a relation to as he was building up his new identity you know his old identity far, started to dissipate in his mind so that, how did he build up his new identity you said like he got his social security card right mm-hmm. uh, obviously that was a first step but do you know how he talked did he mention in the book how he talks to like his friends and family about his past uh well he kind of has something new for everybody, mm-hmm. and uh, his his wife. I think she knew him as a as a Dutch refugee, um, and that was yeah. his background. Um, which uh, she, I think she stayed with him for right for the entire time, even after finding out his actual background. So I guess their relationship, I'm sure, was very real, and I'm sure they very much did love each other. And uh, his daughter ended up taking control of his bookstore in Germany. So uh, yeah. <laughs> there's that. Um, I. That's that's a good question, actually. Um, I, I think he really did commit himself to just, this is going to be how I'm living now. I think he thought he'd never be going back to Germany, and I don't yeah. think he wanted to, really. Um, he was fine with never seeing his mother or father again um, at that point. That is interesting to me, too, because that means he really committed. I guess he was forced to but he, by his situation, but he really did commit then to his new identity of saying, this is just my life. And I agree from... The parts of the book I read, it really didn't seem like he thought he was going to get caught ever. He seemed very shocked. Yeah. There's also this story about how, and this is something that you might take with a big grain of salt because this is something that could be different, interpreted a myriad of different ways from how he does it. But there is a woman in the occupied USSR named Oksana that he got very close to romantically. Mm-hmm. And um, he, says, he says that he just got separated from her when he was taken away from the front. Now, she might have a very different different conception, this uh, Ukrainian-Russian woman, about their relationship. Yeah. But he apparently was very much in love with her and um, says that uh, he wanted to start a life with her um, mm-hmm. outside of the USSR because Pavel was very much an anti-communist. He was a very, very liberal man yeah. um, in many ways. But... Uh, he said that I think he, I think that was probably something that was a watershed moment in his life, um, at least in the army and afterwards, that made him maybe detach from becoming too intimate with people. He was yeah. I, he was clearly never too intimate with his wife, <laughs> consider yeah. uh, at least up until 1953, considering that she didn't know anything about him. Yeah, didn't know it. he he seemed to like brush her off when she would ask about his past and just be like, oh, you know, I was just places. Um, so. You can think about this then again in terms of of labels and identities. Um, And I was curious if you noticed, like, much about the trial period and how, because I think that moment of when he becomes a criminal in the eyes of the state again and in the eyes of his friends and family, at least for a short time, they are at least surprised and have their conceptions of him and their labels of him as a husband or a father or a friend or their neighbor. Those labels that they had and those categories that they had of him are probably shattered or very challenged. Yeah, how do you even recover sudden, your relationship at exactly, that point? Exactly, right. And so I didn't know if you could talk more about like what happens yeah. in that two- or three-year period where he's on trial. He honestly doesn't write that much about mm-hmm. it, but, um, I mean, he keeps his family as far yeah. as I'm <laughs> aware. But I imagine um, the rest of his life went on complete hold, right? Yeah. And he'd lost his bookstore no, and everything. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, his bookstore, if you look it up on Google Maps now, I think it's on Argyle Street in the north side. I mm-hmm. think it's a... A Vietnamese restaurant now, mm-hmm. so a lot of things have changed. Um, he 
lived most of the rest of his life in Germany, um, even though he was a dual citizen. Um, I guess he just was fine with going back home when West Germany was created. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, that's um, I, I don't I don't really know what to say to that. Yeah. But because he didn't write that much about it, I don't know exactly what his what his parents thought or his siblings thought or anything like mm-hmm. that, or his friends who he went to school when he was studying theology or hoping to become a priest, what they thought. Well, it's I think that as we get here though i think that the label surely affected him the rest of his life because he does end up moving back to germany and him being relabeled and being recategorized again as his old identity of reinhold pavel after 1953 and him moving back to germany and being able to re-embrace it changed his life definitely and as a watershed Mm -hmm. i mean obviously but it i think the point i'm trying to get at here is that labeling and how we think about people and how the state then was like no you are reinhold Pavel once again uh and then he was able to readopt his german citizenship that moment of so much happens in that moment he becomes a criminal but he re-becomes mm-hmm. reinhold Pavel. yeah it's impossible to yeah. say exactly what his psychology or thought process exactly. was in that moment um, split identities in so many ways yeah yeah it seems like as a way he kind of allowed the philip rick persona to die because he was able to become himself again I think to me then, as I I brought in the sociology and criminology of, of Malcolm Klein and others and, and Cohen, uh, to name a few, uh, I think that the reason I wanted to bring that in is because uh, his story and the way labels and identities and categories work in it, I think it really demonstrates, though, that that's ultimately what's going on when he gets caught. He just has a new label slapped on him, and that is the source of state power. And that's mm-hmm. the point I want to make is that even though Klein kind of disregards labeling theory – uh, in his 1986 paper, and it's kind of not as well thought of today. I think that labeling theory really matters when you think about it in terms of the state and what the state and the ruling class that drives that state does. Totally. He also like makes a big deal about getting state documents as a means of reinforcing his new persona. Right. He yeah. was over the moon when he got his social security card, and then he later he took a driver's license and got an Illinois state driver's license, and he was the same amount of like excitement over that as like if his new identity was being legitimated through yeah. the process of becoming a citizen. <laughs> exactly, and. I think that's something too is like it's it's a point that like Judith Butler and a lot of other like kind of postmodernists make or post structural post structuralist if you will make is that uh subjects once they're codified by the state become really powerful and ideas and categories any type of category the state can put you in is a form of control over you and I think that's very apparent with Pobble because when he gets become Pobble again in the eyes of the state of Germany and the US his life totally changes. Yep. Well, I think we have to go because we're running out of time on our stream here. Mm-hmm. WRFU is an open forum for the Abana Champagne community, and the views we expressed here tonight are those of we, the speakers, not intended to represent WRFU, the IMC, or the Urbana Socialist Forum. We don't, we're trying to work out the logistics of our next show. It'll be on Christian mm-hmm. liberation theology, especially in Latin America. Um, it'll be kind of theology and history and leftism all coming together in a glorious amalgamation. Yeah. But uh, we're trying to work out our schedule for the next time being, and we'll uh, post when we have info on yeah. when exactly it will be airing. It might not be on August 12th, as initially said, because uh, we're taking a trip together, uh, and we'll be gone, and... Uh, 